Um, good evening, everybody. If anyone wants to stay now after that, I, I'm perfectly you're willing to leave. I don't know, but um, I think I worked on a book with Cedric once, and he said you can only uh, work on it if um, you don't until you get bored, and the minute you get bored, stop. So the minute you get bored, go. I'll try not to bore you. I d Cedric wasn't boring, and it's a quite a difficult. Um, it is a really difficult task talking about Cedric in the position that I'm in, I suppose, without people assuming that sometimes I am, which I obviously am not. Um, so just get that straight. I, what, I, what I do know about Cedric is probably not a lot, but I've certainly seen a lot of his work. I've spent um, the last five years going through all of his archive, um, which is currently held, and probably will be forevermore, held in the uh, archive at the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal. Um, they bought the entire contents of the office, and when I mean the, I mean the entire contents, um, every last bus ticket. And that's the trouble with archives, is that you get everything that's great, and you get lots of not very good bits, um, which is a pretty dodgy thing to say in art, architectural historical terms because everything is supposed to be relevant in some way. Um, but actually what it means is it takes a heck of a long time to go through a heck of a lot of stuff which is in boxes under the ground, uh, three stories under the ground and it only can be traced now by numbers. You can't just walk in and look at a nice drawing here and a nice thing there. You have to go through a list of numbers and basically guess, go, I'll have that one, that one, that one, and hope it's something good. So in a minute, you'll see a bit of uh, where I'm, I've been working a lot in the last five years. And I'm just trying to put this into a bit of context, because somebody came in just now saying, the book is done. I'm working on a complete works of Cedric, um, because that doesn't exist. All the bits of work that any of you have ever tried to find out about Cedric exist in lots of different places. And also, the big difference is that all the things that do exist have been managed and edited and presented by him. Anything after he died, there are one or two bits and pieces. There are one or two books now, yes. But um, mostly, it's been edited by him. So it's very, very uh, engineered by him to serve a particular purpose that he wants to use the media for. Um, so it's useful to bear that in mind as well. So what I'm showing you is raw. It's just raw stuff. Um, and try, I hope, to put across a little bit about what, well, just a bit about his life. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about him, I'm not going to talk about the big favorite projects, except possibly one, because mostly all roads tend to lead back to one of them. Um, uh, talk a bit about his ideas and, and uh, uh, talk a bit about a selection of projects which um, are, which is the reason why I'm talking now, today, because you're, I'm afraid you're guinea pigs. This was really a practice for a talk I'm supposed to give next week, um, which is why it explains the, end, the, the selection of projects, which are all about ports. Um, Cedric liked water, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail. But what it, there's, there's this fantastic project that Cedric um, invented called Polyarch in the early 70s. And the idea being that he was uh, pretty uh, fed up with the idea that all schools of architecture were more or less becoming the same. There used to be a point where there were specialisms in different places. And um, that, that he was trying to counteract that happening. So the idea was that he would um, get, a, get a bunch of students on a bus, and it happened to start at the AA because his office was around the corner, in, just around the corner from Bedford Square, they, uh, with a bunch of students, converted a double-decker bus, uh, and when converted, I mean put a bed and a bath in it, um, and took a bunch of students around the country. The idea of visiting other students, talk about projects, see where the specialisms lay so that they could learn from each other. So um, this happened. I think it was probably a complete fiasco. I'm not sure how they, got, they got, actually got very far. But the idea was pretty good. And that was resuscitated a couple of years ago by John Lyle, who used to work in the, in the office, um, who has now, it's now gone through two iterations. It was called Poly, I can't remember the second one. This year, it's called Polyport. 
And the idea being that um, it would, well, now it's become international. It's not just a national thing. And I think some students, possibly from Westminster, are going. I don't know whether they're here or not. But um, uh, it, it will be in Rome next week. And there are something like 20, 20 schools from around the world who have all been working on projects based around the idea of port and ports and port sites. Um, and they will all be discussed over two days. So this is a kind of resuscitation of this project. So that's what this, pro this talk is really for. So I, I, maybe I shouldn't tell you that, but I, I think it's probably useful to know. Um, OK. So you've seen what the, you've, you read the cartoon. That, that cartoon was in Cedric's boxes, one of his boxes, um, and a really useful description of of fundamentally what Cedric was about. He was really interested in the idea of planned obsolescence. Um, and that's all about lifespan and lifespan in architecture. Uh, and this is another useful sketch. Um, it's a tiny piece of a much bigger drawing. Uh, but right at the bottom, and it's about this is big here, but it's about this big on a piece of paper. And there's a note saying, no clever monuments of which only one use can be found at any one time. So that was another thing that said it was very interested in the idea that something was constantly changing and would change. Um, and the fact that it is actually that big is also a clue into ter in terms of how you start to look at Cedric's work. You're never going to find the big corker drawing. It just doesn't tend to really exist. All the best bits are about this big in corners of other drawings. Um, because he was always making notes to himself. Um, he spent his career as an architect thinking about and testing questions around the inevitability of change in architecture, planned obsolescence, how to design for change, and how to think about anticipating change. He coined the term an anticipatory architecture to describe his own work, and also how to draw for change. And then what that understanding of change meant for architecture as an artifact and in its broader sense as an environment. And implicit in architecture, uh, in his view, was the role of the human being. And he had a real soft spot for human beings. He thought that's what architecture was for, which it is. And he was really interested them, in them, in people. He liked people. And um, that sort of stemmed from, or didn't really stem from, but it's sort of reinforced in some way. One of his favorite books was this book called Good, Good and Bad Manners in Architecture by someone called Tristan Edwards, um, written sometime in the late 1900s, um, where he reorders. You've all heard uh, the, the expression, architecture is the mother of all arts. Well, Cedric took this um, very much to heart and also found it rather a burden and, and fundamentally disagreed with it um, and found uh, in this book by Tristan, a kind of reordering of what, what the arts really were, um, their value, and in terms of their reordering of values, of which architecture comes pretty low down. Uh, so I think that's worth bearing in mind, because architects tend to think they're on top of the world. Um, and I don't think Cedric did. He didn't see his role as being the builder of the pyramid or the builder of the monument. Um, what he saw Ultimately, it was the cultivation of human beauty. And, and second coming in the, in the list is out of manners. Um, those are two useful clues about Cedric and his uh, attitude towards architecture. Um, I apologize for this disgusting map. Um, it was an emergency, and I won't say any more. Cedric came from somewhere called Stoke-on-Trent, a, a, a small village called Stone which is just on the outside. Stoke was the five towns, the five pottery towns um, in Stoke, which many of you may know. Uh, so he, this is where he was born and grew up. And he also spent quite a lot of his childhood, which I'm not sure is little known, and this is the, why this map is so rubbish, is this, this is the Isle of Wight, and this is a place called Hythe uh, near Southampton. And um, he spent quite a lot of his youth in, in Hythe as well. Um, his father was, uh, was an architect, uh, formerly, and well, he first went into the Navy. He was sent to the Navy more or less to get fed, because that was a pl good place to eat. Um, and then he became an architect at the outbreak of the war. Um, and 
subsequent, sorry, not at the outbreak of the war, he became an architect and then worked for, for a company called Harry Whedon. And Harry Whedon was responsible for building all of the Odeon cinemas in, in the country in a very short space of time, uh, approximately six, seven years. All of the Odeon 1930s cinemas were, were designed and, and uh, Cedric's father worked for Whedon between 35 and 30, 33 and 35. Um, then the war broke out, uh, and he then went, um, his father went to work for the British Powerboat Company. So this is where we start, There's a, you're going to pick up the thread, the boat thread now, and ports. Um, so the Powerboat Company was in Hythe, on the south coast. Um, but Cedric's very early memories of, this is a Cedric drawing aged nine. Uh, am I right? Sorry, no, age seven. Um, uh, of there was a village called Silverdale, which any of you who know the Potteries Think Bell maps very well will know it because it's marked on on those maps. Uh, it was one of the one of the Potteries villages, and he calls it Filthy Dale because at that time everything would have been black, thick, thick black smoke everywhere. Um, and it is signed John Price, but his name that was his middle name, Cedric John Price. For some reason, he was called John, but at, at a young age. Um, but that's, it's not a great drawing, but it's quite a nice drawing. Um, and then this is the young Cedric down in Hythe, a very young Cedric with um, a bag around his neck, uh, which had a camera in it. And so he took lots of pictures of boats. That was one of his first pictures of, I don't know what ship it is, but it's a, it's a boat and he's on a boat. Um, and he's still got the same hairstyle and he keeps the same hairstyle for the next 60 years or so, except he changes from tweed. You'll notice there's a shift. You won't notice this, because I'm not going to show you any other pictures of Cedric, actually. But there is a, there is a shift from tweed when he leaves Cambridge to black and white. Uh, but he's in the tweed phase right now. Um, and aspiring to be an architect, really. He learned a lot from his father, who his father was incredibly enthusiastic about his work. Um, and, and taught Cedric very, a lot about drawing. Um, now we're going to skip forward very quickly in order to try to get to some projects, but I'm also trying to give you some sense of where Cedric's coming from and how he got to where he was going. Um, went to Cambridge, studied architecture, then went to the AA and did a diploma there and left in 1957. Um, did his, executed his first job in 1960, big major job um, in 1960 it started, which was the uh, Avery at London Zoo, um, which was then actually completed in 64. But in 1962, um, that, that 1960 moment, he opened his office um, as a young man and, and things really uh, took off um, for him at that point. Um, so in 1962, he was invited to the US and the only way to get there at that time was on a boat. So this was his second boat, and this was the boat he went to the US in 1962 on, called the SS Waterman. Um, and it was paid passage. He didn't have to pay. He didn't have the money for a fare to get to the US. Um, so he went as a lecturer on what was a special student sailing boat and it was full of uh, this particular one had a batch, bunch of Dutch students on it and this is the manifest for the which is a bit blurry I don't know whether you can see it but under here is, there's a the idea was that you was your, your passage was paid if you were a lecturer and as a student it meant it was a long journey and uh, it was pretty entertaining and you you took classes essentially while you were traveling no no uh, sort of three-hour flights and then you're there um, so it was making the most of that crossing um, and, and possibly to have quite a nice time, I suspect, as well. Um, and anyway, on, on the list of lecturers, Cedric is here as architect. And the second one underneath is a man called Anthony Buck, who was a member of parliament at the time. Um, and he was also a lawyer. And Cedric being Cedric and clearly Buck being Buck, Buck um, uh, met each other. And they never met each other before that day arrived to board the ship and, and said, well, how about we just swap identities just for fun? Um, nobody will ever know. You talk about uh, architecture and I'll talk about law, which they managed to carry off um, until they got to New York. Then they were found out and they didn't get paid. 
Um, so that was their punishment. But they had a pretty good time. This is giving a class in one of the cabins. There's Cedric, pretending to be a lawyer. Here's Anthony Buck, pretending to be an architect. Managed to carry it off. Maybe the Dutch, maybe the language wasn't very good or something. I don't know. We don't know. And anyway, I guess they had a pretty good time as well. So they did a bit of limbo dancing. I think that's really what was it, it was all about. Um, so that's how he got to the US, which is another sort of whole story, really, and not really the point of today. It'll be another day. Um, very, very briefly, this just is, is, the, uh, is, is how, how one sees the work in the archive. If any of you want to ever go, and I, I recommend it, if you can get through the kind of wall of Doberman pincers that there are at the door, um, and you can find the right numbers, or any, you, get bun you call up these numbers and you get boxes and folders and big files and all sorts of things like that. And in here, as I said, you never know quite what you're going to get. Um, but what I was hoping I would get, and what I did uh, find loads and loads of, which are again very much about Cedric's way of working, um, were articles and scraps and cuttings and bits from trade catalogues and uh, tons and tons and tons of reference material. He collected everything. Um, and I mean collected it in order to, to find out, re to research stuff um, that was relevant to what he was doing and sometimes not seemingly relevant at all. Um, but it takes us to the kind of theme of, and the theme of port. Um, and back to the title, Portus was a port, the ancient port of Rome. It's also uh, Latin for port. Uh, portable. Um, describes certain technical capabilities that Cedric is interested in. And this is what Cedric really, really liked. He just, that was, that, he just loved this stuff. And look how big it is. That's a car and that's a caravan at the bottom. And that's an enormous crane. He loved, he loved that stuff. And he, it was useful in his, um, in his thinking about architecture. And Port Hull, back to the title um, refers to a particular project, which I'll show you later, and, and again, an attitude towards uh, scale and human beings. Um, so in this collecting of material, he's, he's, he, I guess the question is, where do you look? Um, and Cedric always looked at other disciplines. He looked um, at deep sea. I mean, again, I'm, look, I'm talking now specifically in terms of water, but uh, you know the, the scope is broader. Uh, other, I mean, in this respect, it, uh, he was looking at oceanography uh, to, and, and always technological developments in, in those fields: deep sea oil mining, agriculture. Um, that last bit was the biggest oil, uh, oil, deep sea oil rig ever to move from land onto sea by means of wheels. This was something that. Grew fantastically uh, interesting to Cedric. How do you move very big stuff? Um, uh, there's things like floating uh, runways. Sorry, I can't see this on my computer. Floating airports, um, agricultural machinery that moves, collects, functions, that has multi is multifunctional on a, on a big scale. Um, materials and processes, most, again, from sort of civil engineering, ways of completely kind of reforming land and whole re retaining land. This is a kind of canvas filled with um, concrete and sand. And um, one important question is when you're thinking about movement and designing for change is how do you kind of establish the criteria for movement? So you start to look at things that, that do move and how they move and what are their uh, limits and what are their possibilities. Um, and so and again, it, it just, just to reiterate, it is about moving very heavy, moving heavy stuff. That's what he was interested in, moving heavy stuff like buildings and moving not other, not so heavy stuff um, that's in and around buildings and uh, which undoubtedly has an effect on their use and their lifespan and, as he would say, delight, um, which would be things like water, air, light and people. So these were, those are equal and as, as important architectural components for Cedric, not just the physical artifact, but all of those other less visible or more malleable or intangibles. 
Um, I have to say light is not a central interest, not that I've found anyway. Um, it's not a, a, a reoccurring pre preoccupation. Air is another day, another whole lecture. People also is another day, another talk. Um, uh, but t today it's about water. And um, Cedric positively welcomed it. Most of your architectural training will be about how to keep it out, um, how, to, how to not let water in. And Cedric was really wanted to um, figure out how to, how to use it. That was one of the, a paradox of him that, that he is. He liked all the things that mostly other people didn't like or seemingly argued for, against. Um, so two early projects that were um, very much deal with movement and, and also strangely water a little bit. Um, the Avery, which you know very well, I hope, but in the Avery there's a bridge, which is this cantilevered structure in the middle, um, which had a designed in wobble. So it moved deliberately, and he wanted it to move so that that little person standing on the end would feel that slight sense of anticipation that they either might fall off, they either might fly like the birds around them, or they might be able to stabilize it themselves. I don't know, but it had a designed in movement to it. And Pottery's Think Belt, the other one, which I'm not going to talk a lot about at all, but again, it was about movement and uh, change but a, a system of education, higher education, uh, s designed along these railway tracks um, and an interconnected system of an airport, uh, connections to motorways and uh, local roads, and that these routes would form the, the location for various teaching facilities. But the real um, consequence of that pro proposition was the housing, because in order to let that happen, people had to live near that spot for even for a very short space of time, um, but nevertheless had to be in the proximity in order to, to engage in that system. So all these little symbols here, uh, if you read the key, are different kinds of housing. And that was really the, the bit of the project that, that was developed in some way um, into another whole set of projects called housing research, which uh, Cedric undertook. Um, but crucial to that uh, housing research was the kind of nature of the terrain. This is what the potteries looked like, pretty grey. And uh, the floor, the floor, the ground uh, was pretty unstable. It was all um, slag and old coal and ve very, very wet and um, not particularly great for building on. So Cedric, this, again, he took that absolutely as license and um, embraced it wholeheartedly, that kind of the deficiency of something like that, um, and started to design, uh, this is one particular part, kind of housing on, from the pottery scheme, which uh, tro trod very lightly on the ground. And the idea being that it would, um, one, it was pre they were pre prefabricated structures anyway, that could be moved, but, the, but the, the real interest was what happened where they hit the ground, that they wouldn't sink, that they could essentially stabilize themselves on whatever level. Um, so that's, that's quite key in the next bit. Um, so this is a kind of bridge and a house all together, um, something called, well, it's called both Hague Hole and Hag Hole. Um, and I don't know who Haig or Hag is. I thought I did, but I don't. And it's one drawing. Actually, it's not. It's three drawings. Uh, but they're sketches. And it's for a little beach house um, in North Wales where the, uh, so the, where the surface is wet, uncompacted sand. So that, again, is a kind of great joy to Cedric, the thought of building on something unbelievably fluid and, and rather unstable. And also he, he designs um, something which is seemingly uh, part of a lorry or part of some kind of airport structure, those hoods that join between a, an aircraft and a uh, landing craft. Um, and so uses components which have a degree of flexibility in them. Uh, and there's a boat. So it's the way you arrive. And there's the, there's the plan. The idea is that you know, when you go away, the thing would uh, compact up into a little box. I mean, 
you know, this was done in 1961, so you've seen now billions of projects around this kind of idea, but for entirely different reasons. It's usually been to do with compact, the fact we're living in smaller, smaller, smaller places, and technology obviously has changed. Um, but Cedric's interest at this point is very much the idea of what, what, can, uh, what can meet the earth, what can meet the ground without really le leaving much of a footprint, literally and metaphorically. Um, so made of container parts and some details. But um, just to go on to, oh, how am I doing for time? I'm going very slowly. I'm going to skip some then. Um, 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 um. Well, now some big projects. That's a tiny, tiny little project. And um, Cedric really liked to get his teeth into really big things. And this is a project called Air Portable Dock Ahoy Truck Safe. And it, it was an unrealized project. Um, it was, it exists in very scatological drawings. Um, it's something that you'll see in another uh, project that there are lots of, that was the other thing about Cedric is that some of them are really hideously underdrawn. I mean, Pottery's thing is not, that isn't really a criticism of him necessarily, but it was obviously showed where his concentrations lay and also sometimes just when they ran out of time. But um, it is quite useful to know where to put a drawing or when you need a drawing. And anyone, again, who looks at any of Cedric's work, don't imagine that there's some other drawing that's going to say it all, because there isn't a single drawing that ever says it all. It's always a compilation of a lot of bits of drawings, which you have to piece together. And that's what he wanted you to do, to work as hard as he did, thinking about what he was doing, but trying to piece these things together. Um, so this project, Dock uh, Air Portable Dock Ahoy Truck Safe, was the, the, the requirement, and it was a self-motivated project. It wasn't, a, there was an, it wasn't client driven. It, the, of, the, the office was the client, um, was to find flexible solutions to the problems which occur when conditions change within a transport network. So for Cedric, the real um, excitement, and it was genuine excitement, was the idea of finding how you could get uh, a port and an airport and a truck park to work, um, to be interchangeable, but also to all be non-site specific. So all of these were literally conceived as mobile structures. And so think back to some of those big craft and big cranes and all of those, that kind of gear was all the stuff that he was starting to employ. So that, um, I mean, the, and, and he draws it in the cartoon fashion, which is his own shorthand, um, literally as kind of walking buildings and, and inflatables. And, and he does mean to employ all of those things um, in, in the scheme itself. Um, what it fundamentally has in common with a lot of the projects also is that it is a completely, um, there is no centralized plan. You know, the plan is more or less the, the map of England. So then you, you redistribute this wherever it's required. And the idea being that the dock would be something that was um, held off, offshore so that it would be, I mean, the inference is that they would, they would be employed in, in either emergency situations or uh, the airport, you needed an extra airport because you suddenly saw an influx of of more people all of a sudden, so it could handle these kind of more or less spontaneous changes in society and, and in event of some kind. Um, so let me just, I'm going to flip, these are, uh, these are now sort of sketchbooks that just to go, uh, to, to tell a little bit about his process, um, these were his notebooks, which are all little A6 notebooks. Um, in which most of the most of the working out is done, or most certainly all the thinking is done. They were called his in-head drawings, and they were for himself, not for public consumption. But he's not here, so we can look now. Um, but in there, you've got things like this, which was for the airport, where he's drawing a cone of um, of space, which was the cone of space which you would re would require in order to take off or land an aircraft. So he was literally trying to physically um, describe what might be there at a given time. Um, and more. And then this is just a curious drawing to me, because this is the only now, the only drawing of, of this project about trucks, 
airports, uh, portable docks and portable airports that exist in one place. And it's very, uh, again, it's, a, it's completely atypical of the cartoon drawing. It's not a working drawing. It's, it's, a, it's almost a painting. Um, and it, but it's on the office paper, and it's called A Site is Tested. So he's imagining, he's trying to visualise uh, what the scheme might look like on, from a helicopter view. So you've got a little bit of floating dock out into the water, uh, some suggestion of an airstrip and some truck park occurring here and here in different configurations. But what's really nice about the drawing and what's in almost impossible to show uh, at this scale is the detail and the care with which he makes the drawing. Even though it's very obtuse, it doesn't conclude anything particularly, but it's suggestive. And it's made with pencil and tipex an ink and there's a bit of a rubber stamp tree going on down here but they're just incredibly um, textured it's a kind of thinking drawing really if, of nothing else um, and there's a sort of suggestion which is actually drawn much later um, and it's called city of the future but it, it it recalls a lot of the work that was done in the air, the ADT project where where these different forms of transport come together and how you start to draw that as a city. Um, okay, I am now going to very briefly take you to North Germany. You thought that the potteries was grey, but I have to tell you, if you... Um, have ever been to this part of the world. It's, I've only seen it through Cedric's photographs. There's a city called Hamburg and a city called Bremerhaven, both on the north coast of North Germany, um, of, of Germany, sorry. Uh, both large ports, major, major ports in Europe. And again, a great interest to Cedric um, because of the water. Uh, he was invited, this is Hamburg now, um, he was invited to Hamburg to make a project um, as part of a competition uh, and he produced something called Ducklands and the competition was, um, it was really uh, in order to try to figure out, I and mean, this is was known from uh, London, certainly in the Docklands, that went through a similar sort of phase uh, of trying to figure out how to reinvent or what to do with disused dock areas now that that industry has all become containerized and move out, moved out onto the city edge. And this is right in the centre of the city, and particularly Huffen City, which is the kind of warehouse, old warehouse district. This is the kind of main city proper. Um, but this was the site uh, for the competition. Uh, so Cedric looks at the site and makes a painting. It's another bit of tipex and pencil and photograph. Collage, he made lots of collages um, as detail. Uh, and he proposes that uh, you demolish pretty well everything that's on there, uh, anything within that red line. Uh, this is land, this is water. Uh, so it's uh, most of the kind of old bits of old warehouse, bar I think two listed buildings he decides to keep. And that's what you're left with. The black is what you're left with and the red disappears. Um, and then what he, you do next is, is start to in introduce different kinds of vegetation uh, that will attract certain kinds of birds. Um, it is on the, uh, let me get this right. I think it is gannets. I, it's in a particular breed, and I've now completely forgotten, but it is Hamburg is the last stop for um, certain birds, migrating birds, from the southwest of England before they go up to Siberia. They stop in Hamburg. And um, so Cedric proposed that it should be a pretty good, tasty last stop and uh, start to think about what kinds of vegetation, but more importantly, who... Um, you know, who will be visiting this, the, the town of Hamburg and uh, i.e. the people and how people and birds uh, will interact with each other or not interact with each other, as the case may be. Um, so the project then becomes a whole sequence of bridges and, and ways of, of crossing those waterways 
which are, as you saw on the map, are extremely kind of fragmented. Um, so the project becomes a, a sequence of moving bridges and ways of lifting and moving and choreographing them. Uh, this is a characteristic drawing on a restaurant receipt, uh, but is a pretty, it's about the clearest diagram overall of what he's trying to talk about, which is where land and water meet and how to start to kind of cross over when you want people to cross, when you don't, when the birds are breeding, or I'm not sure they do breed actually at that point in their migration, but anyway, um, to be left to feed possibly. And then a kind of uh, also curiosity about bridges. Hamburg is the city of bridges. It has something like over two and a half thousand bridges, um, which is more than Amsterdam and Venice put together, apparently. Uh, so it was fitting, not only contextual, not a word that Cedric would ever use, uh, but, but certainly in keeping what, with what was required. This is a particular bridge called the Mudmobile, um, which was one idea of a kind of walking, walking bridge. It has feet. Um, and actually, this drawing was made after this model was made. Um, Cedric's brother, who has, he has a younger brother who is still with us, um, was Cedric's model maker. And uh, Cedric hated this model uh, because he, he loved toys and all the, all the models, in fact, every model is mostly made of toys. If you look at it very closely, you can recognise certain kinds of toys that have been broken up and dissected, mostly because I think it gave his brother great joy to do that. Uh, it's sort of like breaking up your brother's toys and turning them into something else. Um, so this is what David did with this one. Cedric did hate it because I think he thought it looked it looked too um, much like something that probably would exist anyway. It's a bit submarine, it's a bit, he, he, I think he, yeah, it wasn't what he had in mind. Anyway, his brother enjoyed making it and that was the drawing. And it, it again, it sort of captures the, the project very well in terms of its intent. But in terms of design intent, it's not what Cedric was really after. I think he was more after this kind of thing, which is again a tiny drawing about that big, um, I so say you have to search really hard, but it's, uh, it's a boat with some kind of lifting gear on it which can turn and swivel and make a bridge above it. And it's sat on kind of uh, footings from the, from the excavation. Um, and this is just a little indication of what happens when you do a competition and you don't win it, which Cedric didn't win it. He didn't win many, any competitions, I don't think. It wasn't some, he always used them as, as tests to think about ideas and to uh, test something out, um, but then would often carry them on in the office. So this is a, just a development in the office well, well after the competition itself, where they're actually thinking about how to construct the, the bridges and um, continue to think about what they're, what they're doing, what their role is in the city. And really what their role in the, in the city was, was to try to link the, the city main. And this is a, another kind of Cedric drawing, which is extremely diagrammatic, um, but trying to sort of, again, it's, they're, they're all tests to see what, when you're making a drawing, um, you do it just to see what it communicates to somebody else. And I have looked at this drawing, I cannot tell you how many times. Uh, again and again and again, knowing the background to the project and, and still I find it difficult to look at. It doesn't really work, I don't think. But the point, the fundamental point is that there, this is the city, the main city, and that it's connecting the main city with the dock area via these rotating connecting parts. So it's a very elaborate way of describing something, connecting it through the built fabric. So I suppose it's one, it's a bit of a warning, and two, it's a bit of a, maybe it's useful to try, it's, well, it's definitely useful to try these things out to see what, what, is, what works and what doesn't. And these are just, again, thrown in as a kind of visual reminder. This is um, on making the competition. Whoever he was working with, these are definitely not Cedric drawings, has made a kind of mini, and these, each one of these cards is about this big, is a kind of miniature version of the pre uh, presentation that they had to make. So um, all kind of little visual clues to what to the stages of the project. Um, I'm very nearly there. I'm just going to show you one more very grey, north, north German 
city, just because it's very similar to the last one, and it maybe it just sort of gives some sense of this is not Fun Palace and it's not Pottery's Think Belt and it's not the projects you may or may not know. This is uh, Bremerhav and another port and looking to, do, to see what to do with this uh, dike area here, which is protecting Bremerhaven proper from the Vesa River, which is here. And so the project really was about this kind of revitalization. This is all happening in the early 90s. Um, lots of cities coinciding with that kind of time lag of containerization moving out and what to do with these inner cities. So yeah, this is another very gray place which needs cheering up. Um, possibly. Uh, I'm now I am going to really whiz through this because it's, I, it's hot in here and I've been talking for a long time. But this is just a plan to show you what, again, what Cedric does, which is, is about bridges and links. And this is a combination of one, two, three, and a bit. This is one bridge conceived as one, three bridges, and a number of mobile um, uh, vehicles and devices, uh, kiosks, ways of, of bringing this kind of dis fairly rejected part of the city back into the center somehow. So it's looking at the kind of very rejected edges and making it part of it. And Bremerhaven was, I think, something like 90% of it was bombed in the war. So there's not a lot to really keep. It was fairly um, desolate as it, as, it, as it is. But there, were what, there was a, a church on one side and a, a square which remained. So it was a way, and there's a river, another river, the Gies that goes across the top. So it was a way of trying to, to make uh, the river, this river, become much more part of the city main. Um, so along these bridges that start to connect through, and it also means they're all linked up through this way, so you don't ever have to go back on yourself. And here, uh, he proposed a kind of concrete stepped beach. Essentially, this is a lot of there's a lot of beach area down here. Um, but uh, an sort of extending the beach into a kind of more permanent fixture. Uh, so again, they're, they're pieces that he places and um, no centralised plan. Yeah, those are little bridges. And there's a kind of, again, a sketch, which actually is probably the best and most useful view, useful view to try and even conceive of what's, what he's trying to do. And then some sketches of certain kinds of... Um, hydraulic platforms which he's thinking about implementing or inventing really. I mean as you can see these are not sophisticated technical drawings but on the one hand they are because they're doing what he wants them to do which is why it's useful to invent things. If you don't think it exists out there you have to just draw what you want and then maybe it does exist. And then you invent another thing which was those little dots um, linked up with something called the Bremer Harvest Shuttle which is again an invention, um, a kind of huge ferry, this big object here, um, which had little tiny boats kind of clustered onto it. And so it would take you around the big river into the little river, and then the little boats distribute and, and let you go off into the, into the city. So there's a, there are, there's a bit of boat design, a bit of bridge design, a bit of civil engineering. That all of those layers are being thought about in any single project. And finally, I'm going to bring you back to the Fun Palace so you'll feel on safe grounds. Thank God he's talking about something that is exciting and that is the only project anyone ever talks about. Uh, and that's probably for good reason, because it's the nicest one to look at, probably. Um, and it is very pretty in lots of ways, but it's also much too complex to talk about in two minutes. But what is useful about this drawing is, and this is where this came from uh, earlier on, but this part of the drawing is all about these separate parts, um, all the components that one go into making up a city, but in Cedric's world, they also go up to make an, any single piece of his architecture. It's as important as the, the artifacts, the, the vehicle, the means of communication, the, the enclosure, uh, the air, the trees, the birds, the grass, all of those parts are crucial to the makeup of the architecture. And the little known fact, I'm only talking about the Fun Palace in terms of water, which I don't think anyone talks about, but it's important because 
No one ever shows the drawing. I don't think everyone's ever printed this one, um, so you're uh, privileged to see it for the first time. But what's crucial about it is that was the sighting of Fun Palace. It did go to various. It was get proposed for many different sites. It was that was its biggest problem. They couldn't find a site that was right. It finally ended up in Mill Meads, um, just below the Olympic Park, that is now the Olympic Park. Um, I'll show you a map in a minute. Uh, but it was right by the river. So this bit of water here, sorry, I haven't got my glasses, this bit of water here, um, was crucial to means of arrival and departure, uh, at just as crucial as helicopter and cars and lorries and people, pedestrians. Um, and in the same folder as that drawing was this scrap, just for uh, precision poses, a bit of scrap about hovercraft. So he was thinking about how you would access, thinking just specifically about how do you access and exit, egress this huge structure. Um, and this, again, just to go back to some of that port uh, kit, the stuff that he was looking at in scraps and in catalogues and in trade magazines, this is the kind of familiar uh, section or elevation in one case um, of the Fun Palace, this kind of profile, it's very reduced profile, and this huge uh, gantry crane which went across the, the top of the whole uh, structure and moved along uh, back and forth. Uh, and that shows it in its kind of final version, but an early version, again a drawing that no one's ever seen um, until now. Uh, is a kind of much cruder version. He was really literally taking given ready-made bits of structure which were to do with ports. It's very well known that he was, he states that he was inspired by Japanese container ports when he was thinking about the Fun Palace. Uh, but here in this drawing takes it very literally um, and in the drawing you've seen before it becomes much more of a designed feature actually. Um, and in terms of drawing, how to draw movement and how to draw change the tipex again came in pretty handy. I know you don't use tipex anymore. You have, you can make things move um, in drawings now, which is, I think Cedric would have really enjoyed. Uh, but he used tipex and dotted it, and that dotted bit means it's warm air and light. There's a clock, but it's sort of about drawing. And that's that bit, a, a important bit, Fun Palace, palace was ne right next to the river. And that just shows, uh, shows it exactly where, where it is in, in the site. That's Mill Meads. Um, and it, these are all uh, the Channel Sea River and the Fleet River all meet. And Fun Palace was tucked right in here. And what's important about this drawing is that these arrows mean uh, are talking about pedestrian access, how people would move in and out of the around the building and access the building and access the site. But then there's a little bit of, I don't know whether you can see it, but there's a little bit of uh, a very deliberate hatching going on around here, which is about affecting the riverbed so that that would become a much more approachable um, edge to the building and a means of access to it. So he wasn't thinking about doors. He wasn't thinking about door furniture, he was thinking about the ground and how to get in from the ground onto the ground. And one last tiny project, which is in a field, in a very, not, it's not a field, it's a very beautiful piece of landscaped uh, uh, park by Sir Humphrey Repton in Cornwall called Port Elliot. And the reason I put it in, it's the other port, which is the porthole. Um, and Port Port Elliot is, uh, uh, as I say, it was designed for, by Humphrey Repton. Had uh, this estuary that came up the up the park. Uh, the owner of Port Elliot, uh, Lord Elliot, um, was a friend of Cedric's who invited him to design for his grandma as a as a kind of me memento of his grandmother, um, a small pavilion in the park and or a folly, really, uh, to be more precise. And um, the, the story goes is that his grandmother was uh, probably, no one really knows much about it, other than she was probably a pretty forceful character, because she managed to persuade uh, the National Health Service to um, buy her a tent 
to put in her garden, which would um, allow her to take the sun and that would remedy whatever she was ailing from. But so the, the story goes that she was prescribed a tent um, and she was clearly a woman of means, so she did not need the NHS to be uh, paying for this. But as a kind of um, nod to that tent, Cedric designs a tent made out of lead. Uh, this is all lead sheet, so it's an incredibly heavy tent. And that, there, is a, there is a tradition of, of metal tents as follies in 18th century gardens. Um, they were often called Turkish tents and they were made out of painted steel or painted cot copper. But Cedric's is lead, so it was very black and very heavy and very, very decorative and with swags. And he talks about, you know, maybe it should have a crystal ball on the top or a gold ball or a pineapple, which was supposed to be very... Um, sign of welcoming or sparklers on the top um, and then it would have this sort of plastic mirrored beaded curtain inside so it's extraordinarily elaborate uh, not like Bremerhaven not a bridge with ducks or just pure folly and then uh, to boot it would be on a rotating platform which should, could then um, rotate with the sun so this object for whoever wanted to go into it would remind them of this bloody minded woman um, and a small porthole. He called his private, ha any design for a private house, I forgot to mention this earlier, um, he did a lot of housing research, but housing research, he meant public housing, but housing on a mass scale. Uh, but when he ever, ever he designs a house for someone, it's, the, the name is a ho is, has hole in it. So there's hag hole, porthole. Um, I guess on the, I mean, one can make all sorts of word associations uh, with that, but I think in the context of today, it's it very much in terms of uh, any port in a storm, which means it's a place of safety and a place of privacy. So um, I hope I have managed to give you some indication of the, some of the scope of Cedric's work, a bit about some of his ideas, and... Um, cannot recommend enough just to go and listen to his lectures, actually, uh, which most of which are held at the AA in the library, and you can go and listen to. But listening to his voice rather than mine is probably more useful. Thanks very much. <laughs>